Um, mixed in central venous, oxygen. Let's see, we have some people as they kind of enter. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, kind of either way. Uh, when people show up, they show up. If they don't, they don't. Some people watch this after. So uh, mixed in central venous oxygen is kind of something that I was pretty bad at when I was in medical school. And I continued to be bad at while I was a first year resident and then continued to be bad at as a second year resident. And now I like to think that I have developed some kind of uh, idea about it. And I would like to make it so that it's just as easy for all of you as it is for me at this point. So what we're going to do is start by defining what they are, right? Uh, explaining the differences between the two. And then the most important thing I think is, uh, you know, what differentiates the two and what factors will affect either one of them. So the first thing we need to, you know, kind of decide is what's mixed and what's central, what differentiates them and, you know, normal values. And so uh, our mixed SVO2, which you're going to see written as SVO2, and our central, which is usually as SCVO2. And the way to remember that is CV, I just remember, is central vein and V is venous. The first thing is that the central O2, this is drawn from your superior vena cava and it's usually from a like a right ij or, or something like that the mixed svo2 is taken from your pulmonary artery okay and this is an important distinction because we have different mixings going on at different points as we go through because this is drawn from the svc it means that it's only getting blood from the upper extremity and from the brain whereas your pulmonary artery means that you have blood mixing from the IVC, the SVC, and the coronary sinus. Okay, so this means that your normal central venous oxygen is going to be usually about 70%, and your mixed SVO2 is usually going to be plus, uh, is usually just going to be about minus, sorry, 5% uh, compared to your central. And that's because the uh, heart, the coronary sinuses of the heart, the heart extracts a lot of oxygen, you know, from blood. So the first and probably most important thing is just understanding when we're talking about mix, we're talking about pulmonary artery, we're talking about central, we're talking about the superior vena cava. And normal is about 70%, 65, 75%. And then your, S, your mix is going to be about 5% less than your central because you're getting that mixing from your coronary sinus on the right. So here's how I think about this. And it's kind of like a big childish analogy, but it's always really worked, uh, you know, for me once it kind of clicked. So the different parts of this. Uh, the first part is we have, uh, I use a, a train analogy. Okay, so for this analogy, the train uh, and its train cars are the hemoglobin, okay? Then we have uh, our oxygen, and our oxygen is going to be our passengers. It's gonna be oxygen, and we'll draw our little kind of oxygen people here, uh, you know, again, for the sake of the metaphor. Um, our tracks all along, you know, the, the, the body, are our vessels, because this is how our train is going to get to, uh, you know, different organs. Our organs are going to be our destinations. We'll call our lungs the loading station. This is where people are going to get on, and, uh, get on the train. And then we're going to check our SVO2 here, which is gonna be our way station. It's kind of like looking at the number of people that are still on the train at the end, okay? So uh, to make this as simple as possible, rather than asking the question like, well, what's a mixed venous O2 mean? What is it, where is it? You know, what does it mean about the physiology? I think the easiest question to start with is 
basically, why would you have more people on the train when you look at the end? And why would you have less people on the train when you look at the end? And so we're going to say a high SVO2, what things would cause that, and a low SVO2, what would cause that, and why. And this is where it gets, you know, surprisingly simple if we kind of take away the thinking about it from a, you know, memorize this for med school and for a test, but rather think about it from the perspective of, well, why would there be more people or less people on the train at the end? So one of the first things that is going to uh, leave you with an increased SVO2 is going to be an increase in your cardiac output or increased heart rate. Um, so long as the you know heart is moving normally because the heart is going to be what's pushing this train along the tracks. And if the train gets to the organ and the train is moving too fast, the flux through the tissue is too fast and the organ doesn't have enough time to take oxygen out of that tissue. And the way that I kind of remember this in general is that, uh, you know, aside from, you know, trying to jump out of a moving train or a fast moving car, it's very difficult, obviously, because, you know, you're going very fast. Um, conversely, a low cardiac output state, uh, such as heart failure, uh, will result in much slower blood flow through the organ and it'll kind of like putter along and the organ itself will extract a lot more oxygen from it because it's, it's moving very, very slowly. Um, I usually think about, uh, it seems silly, but like priapism, for example, the problem in priapism is that there's no venous return. It's sitting in the organ and it's just all the oxygen is being extracted until there's nothing left. And then it comes back. And so, um, a low cardiac output state means you're going to have a low SVO2 because all of the oxygen has been extracted and so there's nothing left in the right side of the heart. Conversely, a high cardiac output state, the blood is going to be moving through the organ too fast and you're not going to really um, pull out enough of it. Um, another big one uh, that's easily for both sides is going to be uh, hypothermia or decreased temperature and increased temperature. So why? Well, temperature affects our uh, need for oxygen. So why do we cool patients, for example? Why do we induce hypothermia in patients who have cardiac arrests? Well, we do that because we want to decrease their oxygen demand, and we do that by cooling them, and therefore the oxygen, uh, the organs will extract less oxygen from that tissue. So in decrease in temperature will overall lead to an increase in your SVO2. And then conversely, if you have a high temperature, people with fevers, not necessarily sepsis, but fevers for any reason, or even when you have, uh, you know, when you're warm, you require more oxygen to do things. Uh, you're a higher metabolic state. So you're going to pull more oxygen out in the organs and you're going to return less to the right side of the heart. Okay. Another one for our uh, high SVO2 uh, this one you see a lot in liver failure patients, and this comes in the form of shunts. So imagine that instead of making it to the organ, our train tracks have bypassed our tissue. Well, now all of a sudden, there is no organ anymore for the blood to have oxygen extracted out of before it makes its way back. So you're going to see patients with maybe fistulas, patients with... Um, uh, liver failure, who have like caput medusa all over and varices and all these things, they're going to have higher than normal SVO2s because everything is going around the target organs and coming back before getting uh, extracted. Uh, another one for a high SVO2 is going to be sepsis. And this I've read mixed things about. Yes, no, maybe it might work like this. In one part, you do have increased temperature with sepsis a lot of times. Some people say that in sepsis, your organs don't use oxygen appropriately. And as a result, uh, because the tissue in the cells can't use it, it ends up getting put back out into the blood and then sent back to the heart. A lot of times you will see a higher SVO2, but I've heard mixed things. Um, so another one that's going to go back and forth between the two, and this is going to be uh, anemia, is going to leave us with a low SVO2. Why? 
Very simple. In our analogy, if you have less train cars, you can carry less people. So for example, if you have 10 train cars with, 100, with uh, 10 people each, you have 100 people. And if 10 people get off at the you know, Oregon station, you're left with 90% left when you go back. But if you only have five train cars and you let 10 people off, now all of a sudden you only have 80% left. So anemia will result in patients having a lower SVO2 because there's a total less number of oxygen people or oxygen being carried to the right side of the heart. Uh, and then the other thing that I'll mention is, you know, bad lungs. Uh, and the reason is basically the same thing. Your passengers can't get on the train. If you have a very hard time oxygenating and you can't get the appropriate O2 into the blood and onto your train to get it to the organs and then back, you're simply going to have a overall total less percentage of oxygen when you draw your SVO2. And then from here, treatment is basically whatever you think it probably is and might be. Low cardiac output state, you're going to give them inotropes. For our temperature, you know, maybe we have to uh, cool them a bit. Or in this case, we need to warm them. Shunts, a lot of times, not so much you can do anything about. And high cardiac output states are usually seen with liver failure, so there's always not a ton you can do. Uh, Anemia, a lot of times we're going to transfuse. You know, give them some blood black, give them some better ability to carry that oxygen. And the last thing, bad lungs, is we're just going to either fix their lungs by, you know, whatever means, uh, getting rid of shunting if we can, um, bypassing them, uh, nitric oxide, all those kinds of things. Uh, and all of these will result in an increased SVO2. And it gives us an idea, um, you know, we can look at FIC and we can look at a couple of other equations and things to kind of get an idea of, of what our total, you know, cardiac output is and flux through tissue. But in general, this is the way that I think about it. I take this kind of train analogy and say, train is red blood cells, people, and then very simply, uh, you know, if it's hotter, if there's better weather at a destination, more people are going to get off and therefore there's going to be less to be counted back here. If the weather's super cold, people don't want to get out, they're going to stay on the ride and head all the way back. And then from a physiologic standpoint, it you know, makes sense that if your tissue doesn't need oxygen, it's not going to um, need to pull out as much. So with the metaphor, I think a lot of times it, it in general makes you know, a decent amount of sense. And this is pretty much it for mixed and central venous O2, the, uh, the introduction to it. You know, clinically, things get very different when you're working with it in person, ways to affect it, what you're going to see, what you're going to do with it, uh, when you should treat it, all those kinds of things get very nitty gritty clinically um, and are patient dependent, cardiac versus, um, you know, your, your SICU and MICU and kind of what your target and goal is. But this is more so for interpretation and an understanding of what a mixed and central venous O2 is and what kind of physiologic states affect it and why. And hopefully you won't have to memorize this anymore. That's my goal for all of you is you don't have to memorize this. This will just make sense when you get a question on a test or something is happening to your patient. You're like, oh, my liver failure patient has this super, super high SVO2. Why is this happening? Do I need to do anything about it? Can I do anything about it? It's like, no. Well, He's probably in a super high cardiac output state and he probably has shunts all over the place. So maybe not. But if you have a patient that you suspect is in septic shock and this is an, um, I'm sorry, cardiogenic shock and this might be another indicator. Oh, his heart's not working. It looks eh. And his SVO2 when we pulled was like 50%. Maybe he needs, you know, inotropic support. Maybe he needs something else.